Good afternoon. I'm Tom Cadigan, Associate Director of Alumni Relations, and I'd like to welcome you to today's Lunchtime Learning webinar event. This is the second in a series of two fall web-based presentations that feature Holy Cross professors discussing their area of expertise and research. We're thrilled to have Cynthia Hooper, Associate Professor of History here at Holy Cross, joining us today for a talk entitled, What Does Putin Want? Playing for High Stakes in the Superpower Struggle Over Ukraine. A very timely topic. Professor Hooper holds a PhD from Princeton University and is an expert on Russian and Soviet history, comparative dictatorship, and culture and politics in 20th century Europe. We're so happy to have her join us today. We'll be together for about 75 minutes, a great opportunity to relive your Holy Cross classroom experience. Professor Hooper will speak, and then we'll take questions from you, our listeners, for as long as time allows. I encourage you to submit questions throughout this presentation by checking out the question function located on your webinar toolbar on the right. Thank you so much for joining us. And now it's my pleasure to turn things over to Professor Cynthia Hooper. Well, hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for tuning in on a Friday. Um, thank you to Tom for having me, and especially for um, conceptualizing this whole lunchtime learning experience. I think this is a wonderful way for members of the Holy Cross community to reconnect outside the uh, university, and I'm honored to be a part of it. Um, so, as regards the topic for today, those of you who are not Facebook friends with Vladimir Putin might have missed the fact that last Tuesday was his birthday. He turned 62, and across Russia, oh, the, the, actually, the, uh, sorry, we're having, I can't actually move the pictures. Sorry, everyone. Okay, sorry. Okay, so here we go. So, Facebook friends of Vladimir Putin might have missed the fact that Putin turned 62 on Tuesday. And across Russia, a whole variety of celebrations took place to commemorate this glorious event. Fans of the Russian president printed t-shirts. And in Grozny, the capital of Chechnya, they formed a living Russian flag that was 650 yards long. Uh, in Moscow, a group of anonymous artists displayed a series of paintings depicting Putin as Hercules, performing 21st century versions of the 12 labors that gained the original Greek hero immortality. These paintings include the one shown here, which features a scene of Putin slaying the many-headed hydra of U.S. and European sanctions. Of course, such displays beckon the question not only of what does Putin want, but also of who in the world can take such kind of art seriously. But if it is to be taken seriously, this type of image perhaps does suggest the extent to which a significant number of Russians admire Putin for, as they see it, standing up to the United States in defense of Russia's national interests. Now, as we all know, the current tensions between the United States States and Russia, like the sanction struggle depicted um, in this previous slide, have to do with the civil war that is raging in Ukraine and with the different ways that our two countries see that struggle and each other's respective role, real or imagined, in contributing to it. Our mutual suspicion about each other's motives and intentions dates back to the very beginning of the Ukraine conflict, almost a year ago when protesters in Kiev first began to gather in the city's main square, the Maidan, back in November, um, and you can see the demonstrations in this slide here, to show their support for closer ties between Ukraine and the European Union. Over time, the demonstrators erected shanty towns, they built barricades, they designed makeshift weapons, and in February, clashes with police and a sniper attack from rooftops around the square left at least 141 people dead. We all know the narrative that unfolded thereafter, 
Democratically elected, then President Viktor Yanukovych fled, taking refuge across the border in Russia. Russia, for its part, encouraged the autonomous Black Sea region of Crimea to secede and then announced its determination to annex the peninsula. And finally, in eastern Ukraine, pro-Russian separatist militias began to form and to proclaim regional independence. The situation between the two superpowers radically worsened this past summer when these separatist battalions launched an all-out war against the Ukrainian army. As part of this struggle, guerrilla fighters in the east apparently shot down a Malaysian Airlines commercial jet by accident using a surface-to-air missile and killing all 298 people on board. Since that time, people watching and analyzing this conflict from afar have begun to consistently speak of an information war that is going on in tandem with the military battles taking place on the ground. In this information war, all the protagonists involved are fighting to shape the story of the crisis that is being told to audiences both at home and abroad. As different groups fight for territory and influence in eastern Ukraine, they are also fighting for hearts, minds, and money further afield, in part by trying to tell the story of the conflict in certain ways. Now, U.S. politicians and journalists have also played a role in this information war, although that role has arguably uh, been more of an inadvertent rather than a deliberate or deliberately manipulative one. Uh, while I personally believe that our country's media coverage of the conflict has improved over time, there's no denying that in the early months of the struggle, as demonstrators in Kiev took over the Maidan, U.S. politicians from both parties jumped to show their immediate solidarity um, with the demonstrators um, in kind of a marked contrast to our conduct um, recently in regard to uh, the student protests that uh, were sweeping Hong Kong. In the case of Ukraine, it seemed as if everybody aged 45 or older automatically chose to read the Maidan protest in Cold War terms, seeing it as part of a continuum of heroic past battles by Eastern European activists against Soviet oppression, whether that be the Hungarian Revolution in 1956 or the Prague Spring of 1968, or even the strikes of Poland Solidarity Movement in 1980, or the demonstrations in East Germany that led to the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. We automatically assumed that a side with a pro-European platform must be all good, and that any position with a pro-Russian orientation must be all bad. And now, this is not at all to say that um, uh, most of the demonstrators and fighters on the Maidan were not worth our sympathy and that their cause was not an extremely admirable one. Um, but not all the demonstrators shared the same goals. More importantly, many of the politicians who claimed to champion their cause were not what we would consider to be valorous Democrats committed to legality. Instead, they were, and in many cases still are, simply ambitious individuals who saw pro-Western rhetoric as a tool of political power and as a potential means of accessing large amounts of financial assistance from abroad. Again, this is not meant in any way to dismiss the entire democracy movement in Ukraine, just to say that the U.S. became so partisan so quickly that as a nation, we lost um, a great deal of, of appreciation for nuance or complexity. Instead, we immediately pointed the finger at Russia for propping up what we cast as an utterly cruel, heartless, immoral, tin-pot dictatorship regime, ignoring the fact that then-President Viktor Yanukovych had been democratically elected by voters in full knowledge of both his pro-Russian leanings and his long record of corruption. We blame Putin for Yanukovych's failings, openly comparing Putin's actions to those of Joseph Stalin, setting up puppet states across Eastern Europe in the years after World War II. In my opinion, 
this public taking of sides in a conflict we so quickly cast in Cold War terms of absolute good fighting against absolute bad was a mistake. It set a string of events in motion that otherwise, I believe, could have been avoided, and it sparked a situation which has escalated in recent months to the point that any stable end game solution seems hard to imagine. So what I would like to do for the rest of this talk is to mention a few issues that I think have been neglected in mainstream U.S. media coverage. First about Ukraine, then about Putin, before opening things up uh, for questions and observations from you. Again, my aim here is not in any way to defend the Kremlin. I have always thought that Putin was a strong-willed and dangerous leader committed to challenging U.S. hegemony and I personally am horrified by the decisions he has made in recent months and their potential consequences. But I think it is extremely important for us to better understand his analysis of the world, if only so that we can make more informed policy choices in dealing with his country. So, let's start with Ukraine. What do we know about this country? First, it's a very big expanse of territory. It's the largest country in Europe, about 1.7 times the size of Germany. Secondly, it's a very poor country and has seen less growth since independence in 1991 than almost any other former Soviet republic. Even before this current crisis, in 2012, the per capita GDP in Ukraine fell just below that of both Namibia and Iraq. The median monthly salary is currently about $260, and this year its currency has been the poorest performing monetary unit in the world, uh, losing, according to Forbes magazine, 35% of its value during the first four months of 2014. The World Bank has recently warned that Ukraine faces an 8% economic contraction, and that's even with $18 billion in IMF aid and another $9 billion pledged by the United States and the European Union. Thirdly, it's a very divided country and has been since independence. It's divided ethnically, and we can see this in, in the chart here, uh, with Ukrainian speakers concentrated in the West and Russian speakers, as signified by the yellow and brown shadings, uh, congregated in the East. It's also a country divided economically. Besides the capital city of Kiev, which is the red circle kind of in the center of the country, um, and the area immediately around the capital, the western two-thirds of the country is actually the poorest because it's so predominantly agricultural. Now, the role of um, farming in Ukraine was, has been historically seen as a very profitable one. In fact, the Ukrainian flag, which is a stripe of blue atop a stripe of yellow, is meant to symbolize that abundance, signifying an, a bright blue sky over a golden field of wheat. Um, but in the post-independence world, um, this reliance on uh, agriculture has um, you know, not yielded a great amount of economic growth. It's the area to the east of the country that has done better, and that's the area of coal mines and heavy industry that's tied to Russia. Such a map suggests the importance of the precept that it's the economy stupid, because it indicates that at least until war broke out, basically all Ukrainian citizens shared a desire for prosperity. They just simply differed over where they saw the best opportunities for that prosperity to emerge. We can see this difference in a slide of election results from 2004, where a pro-Europe candidate won in the West and a pro-Russia candidate won in the East. And we can see this division again today with sites of pro-Russian protests matching almost exactly to um, the 2004 election map and the sites of uh, Ukraine um, that voted for the pro-Russian presidential candidate. 
Even a chart of annual imports and exports shows how much the country is both divided between and yet dependent on both Europe and Russia, with Russia just edging out the European Union by one percentage point as Ukraine's most important trade partner. Fourth, Ukraine is a very corrupt country with a troubled democratic process. In 2012, again, long before this uh, current conflict began, Ernst & Young ranked Ukraine the third most corrupt country in the world. And no, Russia was not one of the first two on that list. Um, this chart is a little confusing because actually uh, the higher the bars, the worse the corruption, right? But um, if you look at it in, in that way, you'll see that Russia outstrips, uh, the, uh, sorry, Ukraine <laughs> outstrips Russia by all the key corruption member, uh, measures except freedom of the press. And freedom of the press is that um, column in gray at the far right. If you look at where the black diamonds are placed, Ukraine then has higher measurements across the board in terms of corruption than any of these former Soviet republics except Uzbekistan. It's no secret that former President Yanukovych, shown here with Putin, likely siphoned off billions of dollars from the Ukrainian state budget. Uh, one of his lavish homes outside Kiev was found to include not one but two gold-plated toilets and an array of artworks and jewel-encrusted animal sculptures um, you know, that, that immediately prompt international disdain. But the problematic fact remains that in both the criminality and its conspicuous display, Yanukovych is not exceptional. No Ukrainian president has held office without a major corruption scandal confirmed by international investigative or watchdog organizations. And these have included leaders with staunchly pro-West platforms. They even included the eventual 2004 election winner who claimed to have been poisoned and horribly disfigured by pro-Russian political opponents, including former members of the Soviet KGB. The impact of such corruption on ordinary people is significant and, and should evoke our um, extreme compassion. An op-ed in the New York Times this past week was written by a Ukrainian young man who had just received a notice that he had been drafted into the Ukrainian army. And in the editorial, he described how he now faces the difficult choice of either having to pay over $2,000 of his own money to equip himself with military supplies, and that includes everything from winter clothing to gun sights, helmets, and body armor, or having to pay a $2,000 bribe to receive a medical certificate exempting him from service. Whatever their political affiliation, he writes, Ukrainian bureaucrats have pocketed so much of the country's defense budget that the government can no longer adequately supply new recruits. Finally, since independence, Ukraine has been at best a troubled democracy with a politics of literal struggle in evidence both inside the halls of power and on the streets. Fistfights in the Ukrainian parliament, the Rada, are common. Now, this particular picture is from the spring following the referendum in Crimea, but there are more from the many brawls that have taken place just over the past two years. And these are a couple of close-ups. And my favorite is this one. You can see you know, that one man is literally gouging out the eye of his colleague. Serious political figures have even defended these violent outbursts, calling them an example of, quote, democracy in action, allegedly representing a type of active disagreement that could never take place in a dictatorship. You'll never see these kinds of fights in North Korea, one parliamentary deputy boasted. He added that fights might be unproductive, but that physical force is, quote, the last resort for delivering your point when vocal methods fail to work. Such tactics are also endorsed by the right wing side of the Ukrainian political spectrum, where groups such as right sector and freedom march through the streets at night 
mimicking fascist, fascist rituals and promoting ideas of Ukrainian racial superiority and anti-Semitism. These groups were highly visible in the protests in Kiev this past winter and have also been very involved within and alongside the Ukrainian military in fighting separatists in the East over the past few months. As a result, they are poised to do well in parliamentary elections scheduled for the end of October, having, in the words of one analyst, quote, built influence and symbolic capital through clever exploitation of both the successful Maidan demonstrations and Russia's threat to Ukrainian sovereignty. Russia, of course, is continuing to massively exaggerate this threat of right-wing proto-Nazi power in its television coverage of Ukraine. Russian propaganda portrays any struggle against the current Kiev-based government as a fight against fascism, as in this poster from March urging people in Crimea to vote in the referendum on independence. Here that referendum is cast as a choice between either a Nazi swastika on the left or a Russian flag on the right. This is how Russia shapes the story of the Ukrainian conflict, and government officials do so by active censorship, including direct Kremlin supervision of the country's television coverage. Russian politicians, and certainly Putin himself, have also over time come to engage in a politics of seemingly deliberate misinformation as well, infuriating Western leaders by blatantly denying established facts, such as the presence of Russian soldiers in eastern Ukraine. However, matters are not helped by the fact that Ukraine is also a player in the information and misinformation war. Government officials and journalists are required to use terminology in Ukraine designed to elicit sympathy from a Western audience, referring, for example, to fighters in the East not as separatists or as rebels, but only as terrorists and refusing to acknowledge Amnesty International's labeling of the conflict as a civil war. Now, this is arguably a legitimate policy, and it's something that any government, including our own, does to win favorable headlines, particularly in a time of war. But such tactics have, in recent months, shaded into incendiary reporting almost as unreliable as that which is coming out of Russia. For example, when Ukraine's defense minister was on a state trip to Poland last month, he announced that Russia had detonated at least two three kiloton nuclear explosive devices in the battle around the airport in the besieged city of Lugansk. If it were not for the atomic bombs, we could have held the airport for months, the minister is quoted as having said. His comment prompted a variety of sarcastic Russian responses like the one tweeted by the country's deputy prime minister seen here. Other Russian politicians joked that the Ukrainian security service should investigate what the polls must have slipped into the minister's glass. So what role does Putin play in all of this? Certainly Putin takes a very cynical view of Ukrainian politics and has been frustrated, which is to say deeply angered, by what he perceives as the United States' overly naive attitudes. In, ter in terms of who he is and what he wants, well, this is a $3 million question. It's what um, I was immediately asked when I was on uh, CNN to comment on breaking news stories. And, and the truth is that nobody really knows. Putin himself probably doesn't know. At this point, he's testing. He's looking for opportunities, and he's responding to changing the situations. Over the past months, his behavior has grown confusing and unpredictable and his increasing disregard for Western public opinion and his flat denials of known realities have come to particularly mortify leaders like German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who has enjoyed a relatively close relationship with Putin. We see her laughing with him here at the Winter Olympics in Sochi, which seemed like such a long time ago. Um, and this summer, watching Germany win the final game of the World Cup with him in Brazil. However, Merkel was deeply disappointed with Putin's response to the downing of Malaysian Airlines MH17 little more than a week later, and she has come to be one of the most uh, staunch proponents of economic sanctions against his country.
on October 3rd, she clarified her position in very strong terms, accusing Russia of violating international law and of destabilizing the post-World War II status quo. So, what do we know about this leader? Well, it seems to me that Putin has a set of grievances and a set of ambitions that have remained remarkably consistent since he first took power 14 years ago. And while these ambitions don't involve the actual reconstitution of the Soviet Union, they do, I believe, include a desire to, change, to challenge what he perceives to be U.S. hegemony in the world. As regards Ukraine, Putin has been saying for 14 years that Russia will never allow the country to be absorbed into Western alliances like NATO and the European Union without Russia also being allowed to join. He has repeated this sentiment again and again. First, when he took office in 2000, less than a year after NATO admitted, admitted three new members from Eastern Europe. And he reiterated his position when, over Russian objections, NATO admitted seven new members in 2004. These are four Eastern European countries and the three Baltic states. At the same time, Putin is not a communist, and he arguably never really has been. He comes out of the Russian security services, the KGB, and is steeped in ideas popular within that institution that date back to the death of Joseph Stalin in 1953 and to the secession struggle that followed between political police chief Lavrenti Beria, seen here on the bottom left, and party boss Nikita Khrushchev on the bottom right. These two men had different power bases, but also very different visions of post-Stalin development. Beria, who was a completely unsavory character known for his brutality, uh, heading up both the NKVD and later the Soviet nuclear project, um, was also a pragmatist, impatient with communist doctrine and with unprofitable, unproductive economic policies. Khrushchev, on the other hand, was the former Communist Party chief of Ukraine and was to some extent a true believer with a power base grounded in the Soviet Party structure and a conviction that the way forward for the USSR after Stalin was to revitalize and strengthen communist ideology rather than to abandon it. Beria at the time favored a pattern of economic development much like that which China began to follow in the 1980s, one that focused on developing a strong state, suppressing civil liberties, encouraging patriotism, and stimulating economic development in which the state would be closely involved in market forces, but in which those forces would, at least to some extent, be allowed. Now, back in 1953, when Stalin died, Beria lost the power struggle, and it cost him his life. Khrushchev had him arrested and executed later that same year. In fact, the support Khrushchev received from Ukrainian Communist Party leaders during that secession struggle is thought to be part of what inspired him to suddenly give Crimea to what was then the Soviet Republic of Ukraine one year later in 1954 during a somewhat mythological anniversary celebrating 300 years of alleged Russian-Ukrainian friendship. In other words, people argue that Ukrainian party leaders got Crimea as kind of payback for um, backing Khrushchev uh, in this leadership struggle. But that's a separate issue. What I want to emphasize here is that for the remaining decades of Soviet power, these rival visions of development, call them autocratic versus ideological, flourished within their respective institutions, the KGB on the one hand, the party on the other, often creating a great deal of tension behind the scenes. Now, Vladimir Putin is of a piece with that barrier vision, meaning that he is at base, a realist and a pragmatist, straight from that same security services milieu. Yes, he absolutely saw the collapse of the Soviet Union as a tragedy, 
and he is no fan of the man he believes let it all happen, the last Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev. Yet he is not locked in some nostalgic vision. He understands, in particular, that national power and individual prosperity are today irrevocably linked to market growth and mass consumption. In fact, he has repeatedly mocked U.S. President Barack Obama for allegedly being too socialist and thus not understanding what a country really needs. What Putin is, in my opinion, is a proponent of realpolitik over principle, of blood and iron over speeches, rules, laws, and debates. Thus, I think it's useful to compare the antagonism that exists today between him and President Obama um, to, that, uh, to the conflicts that raged between German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck and British Prime Minister William Gladstone during the era of German unification towards the end of the 19th century. At that time, Gladstone was internationally viewed as representing uh, diplomatic options and Bismarck as defending militaristic tendencies. Um, Gladstone was seen as a liberal moralist who was committed to peace, retrenchment, and reform, as well as justice for the Irish and freedom for other oppressed peoples. While Bismarck, by contrast, was considered a conservative autocrat who unified Germany through industrialization and war, the iron and the blood. A New York Times obituary for both men who died in 1898, both of them within months of each other, um, praised Bismarck, um, but cast the difference between these two leaders in, in, in a very provocative and, and I think, uh, a helpful way. They said, Gladstone believed himself a representative of the people, while Bismarck believed himself to be a ruler of them. Now, I consider that Putin sees himself as very similar to Bismarck in his philosophy of power. He is a nationalist, committed to building Russian greatness, also committed to illiberal principles. No Democrat, at least as we in the United States, would define the term. He is not adverse to breaking rules, and he is very committed to challenging what he and many other Russian leaders see as would-be American dominance in the post-Cold War world. As the head of the Russian presidential administration recently explained, quote, Russia is holding an independent policy and unwaveringly protects its national interests. It is not easy to explain that to the world, but it can and must be done. Now, Putin likes to convey his dedication to Russia's political strength through a language of cliched uh, and very literal male strength in which he portrays himself as a defender and protector uh, of the country um, engaged in what the Russian state news agency has described as a series of um, the president's quote trademark adventure activities. Um, many of these strong and powerful photo opportunities are highly orchestrated. You see him as a pilot swimming in the coldest lake in the world, bareback on a horse. But my particular favorite is uh, a photo of Putin going scuba diving in the Black Sea, conveniently just off the coast of Crimea, although this is an event that took place in 2011, and just happening to discover not one but two ancient Greek urns. Now, many Russian leaders are fond of using these macho tropes to portray U.S. leader President Obama as weak and foolish, particularly in comparison. And this is an idiom which, unfortunately, a number of conservative pundits and comics inside the United States have also at times adopted. And we see here um, just a, a cartoon where Obama is being mocked for uh, his deference to other world leaders, um, and Putin is being praised for his alleged uh, forthright and authoritative demeanor. Uh, certainly before the downing of the Malaysian airline flight, there was an almost wishful, wistful, we wish we had our own Putin vibe uh, on U.S. talk show airwaves. 
Today, this kind of macho imagery, going back to where we began with Putin Hercules, seems to be fueling the president's sky-high rates of domestic popularity. Now, I'm not sure I believe these popularity numbers, you know, that, that sort of hover around 90% exactly, and that's something I can get into more uh, in, in questions. Um, but I'm also not sure they really matter, because um, to be honest, Putin at the moment does not need popular support to rule, and the Russian people um, don't see themselves as having uh, any realistic political alternatives. Um, but so just to conclude, what do we make of all this? I'd like to throw out uh, three observations before um, hopefully hearing from you. First of all, we need to have an end game solution in mind that can ensure the security and stability of Ukraine. And unfortunately, this will not happen without Europe and Russia working together. The sanctions that have been leveled against Russia are doing something. Um, the country is struggling with inflation, a massive amount of capital flight, and sluggish business, especially with the fall in oil prices. But winter is coming, and there is this question of who is going to blink, uh, blink first, and what country will collapse first economically, Russia or Ukraine? And, and really, there's, there's no contest there. I mean, Ukraine was in dire straits before war began, and it's, and it's in even worse straits now. Um, Europe also doesn't want to risk uh, losing its oil and gas imports from Russia should energy be added to the sanctions list. And all of these factors kind of point to a need to continue to seek some kind of compromise. Secondly, we need to tone down any kind of crazy inflammatory rhetoric. I mean, U.S. Uh, political leaders uh, have been talking um, in recent months about arming Ukrainians. They've been openly comparing Putin to Hitler in public. Um, I think that we need to sadly accept that any solution here is going to have to involve the triumph of realpolitik over principle, um, particularly given our current moment of intense global geopolitical crisis and change. So that means that we as the U.S. can put pressure on Russia and continue sanctions, but we also have to pressure Ukraine. We're not going to be able to prop up the country by ourselves uh, without Russia's uh, assistance. Um, and we have to beware of um, raising false expectations on the part of the Ukrainian people that we might be prepared to do so. I think that uh, we are going to have to accept the fact that um, Ukraine will have to uh, exist in some kind of non-aligned status um, and give up ideas of involving the country in NATO or the European Union. Um, and at the same time, I also believe that we need to strengthen our commitment to countries that are already within NATO. So we'll give Russia something, but we'll also draw a line in the sand and tell them you can have, you know, you can have what you want in this regard, but go no further. And I, as I hear myself saying this to you, I'm kind of shuddering in disappointment because, you know, this isn't a solution that I embrace, but I think that it's the only practicable and possible one. And I'd really be interested in hearing your opinions in just a minute. Um, and finally, I think that you know, Putin's actions have been despicable, particularly in recent months. But we have to understand that right now the world is full of shades of gray and that it is in our interest to have Russia more as an ally than an enemy, particularly in fighting ISIS and in the battle against international terrorism. We can encourage political change in Russia but we should perhaps do so in more subtle ways than we're doing now. Um, and we should also keep in mind that it's perhaps not in our best interest to strengthen Russia's bond with China at our expense. Acknowledging the triumph of realpolitik over principle is not a happy moment. But as I said, we cannot afford to raise expectations in Ukraine that we will not be able to keep. And in a world that looks increasingly more threatening day by day, I do believe that it is better to seek a path with Russia that emphasizes compromise over confrontation. Well, thank you very much. We'll allow
Professor Hooper a chance to collect her thoughts, grab a cup of water after that wonderful presentation. Um, and as we turn to the question and answer portion of, of this webinar, um, clearly there's a lot of interest in this topic because I've been monitoring the feeds and there's a lot of questions for Professor Hooper. So when, when she's ready, I'll, I'll serve as MC of this, this question and answer period. Um, one common question that has been asked throughout this presentation is, in your opinion, do the Russian people have any interest in a return to communism? What, what, what are their thoughts um, from, from a popular standpoint um, regarding communism? And does Putin play a role in that at all? Well, that's an excellent question, and, and it's another thing that I think that, that the U.S. media is, is, is uh, sometimes misrepresenting. I was uh, just over there um, in the spring and summer, and you know, no one in the Soviet Union except for, uh, you know, a few older people living in the more distant regions um, advocate for a return to communism. Being pro-Putin and even being um, uh, opposed to U.S. policies is in no way meaning uh, being pro-communist. In fact, if you land in St. Petersburg, there's now a Starbucks right outside the baggage claim area, which just seems amazing to me, um, you know, uh, because, because in a way, Russia appears to me to be so much more integrated into uh, sort of this mass consumption idea than it, than it was even just five years ago. Um, so I think uh, two things. I think, first of all, uh, Putin does have extremely high popularity ratings. Like I said, they top out at almost 90%. But it's funny, I'm, I guarantee you that every single one of those people that's part of that 90%, if they had the opportunity, they'd take a plane ticket to New York and be thrilled about it. Like, they, they, they actually really admire many things about the United States and U.S. culture. What they see now is that uh, the U.S. and Russia are kind of locked in a battle over economic development, capitalist economic development, and, uh, and, and many people feel that Russia should be acting in its interests in order to further the capitalist economic development of its own country. Um, another question that, that a few people have asked is, how are the countries surrounding the Ukraine, specifically Poland, Belarus, um, Hungary, um, how are they reacting to this crisis? Another excellent question, and it's a hot button issue because NATO is finding itself right now internally divided. Um, there are, you know, the sort of um, key countries of, of you know, Britain, France, and Germany that, that don't so much want to antagonize Russia right now. And, um, and then there are the uh, more recent NATO members um, and those countries that are closest to Russia, particularly Poland and the Baltic states, uh, whose leaders are warning that, 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 that Russia is uh, launching sort of a a plan of, of, of gradual territorial acquisition. And they, you know, again, consider everybody is involved in this information war to some extent. And these countries are interested in securing increased commitments from NATO to protect their own security. So they are presenting a story of, of, of Putin's actions where you know, Putin is portrayed much like Hitler in 1938, 1939, when Hitler sort of progressively, you know, annexed Austria, then took over the Sudetenland, and then, um, despite the Munich Agreement, um, actually invaded all of Czechoslovakia. Um, and they warn that if we don't take a stand now against Russia and make Ukraine the, the, the grounds for confronting the Russian leader, then um, Putin will sort of take that as a green light and see that as a, a, you know, a sign that he can risk uh, invading other countries. 
and again, they like to use this language um, of Putin wanting to reconstitute the Soviet Union. Now, I don't think that's the case. I think that there have been actually some very troubling Russian incursions into uh, the Baltic states. There have been some assassinations that seem to have taken place um, that have been orchestrated by the Russian security services. And this is, of course, extremely troubling. And I think that, again, as I said, we have to emphasize to Putin that we will not accept any kind of interference in NATO countries. Um, and that is our absolute line in the sand. But Putin's a realist. I don't think that he, he, uh, he understands that power is different. He understands that, that, that capitalism is, is the way to prosperity. And, and he's, he wants Russia to be strong and powerful and a superpower. But he's not into like sort of getting these 15 republics back together in this new kind of political union. Um, I, I don't think that that is his, initiative, his ambition. Do you see a scenario where Ukraine is possibly split into an eastern and western half with perhaps a, a, an eastern half under direct Russian control? Yes, well that's what I mean when um, I'm saying that uh, I don't think anybody knows exactly what Putin wants, and I don't think even Putin knows exactly what he wants right now this second. And I think that he is exploring certain options as the situation continues to unfold. There's going to be a, a, another exacerbation of this crisis soon. I'm, I'm convinced there are elections scheduled for the end of this month. Um, and you know, it's, it's going to be touch and go to see whether the ceasefire, which is already tenuous, can continue at all to hold. Um, so I think he's keeping his options open. Some people have suggested that he might at least uh, want to take over some kind of land corridor that will allow Russia to directly connect with the Crimea, um, supplying the Crimea. Um, for Russia is going to be an enormous expense. If you see here on the bottom left of this new slide, the burden of the Crimea um, uh, to supply, Russia now needs to supply Crimea with natural gas and with water and with electricity and it needs to find a way to do so and currently there's no kind of land corridor linking the Russian mainland from Crimea. The only way to get to Crimea is by boat and there's plans to build a bridge but that of course you know is going to take best case scenario a number of years. Um, but again I think this is all in flux. One issue that's problematic with, with uh, any kind of partition of Ukraine is that there are no natural barriers except the Dnieper River which basically flows straight through Kiev and is far further to the west than um, uh, than the uh, pro-Russian rebels, you know, you know, have been have been congregating in, and and you know that would be uh, again extremely troubling for the world, and also highly unrealistic to 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 want to seize territory all the way um, through to that. So I, I think that um, any attempt to take over and hold a big chunk of territory in eastern Ukraine would bring Russia more problems than benefits. And again, because Putin is a realist, I mean, in addition to being an adventurist and, and at times acting like kind of a crazy person, I think, you know, he looks at the bottom line. And I think that the Crimea is enough of a giant financial burden and holding on to a country that's going to be, or a chunk of a country that's going to be riven by guerrilla warfare, no matter who has uh, control of it, um, is not in his best interest. And in fact, Putin plays a very sneaky game of manipulation behind the scenes as a general rule. And I mean, it's so much more in, in Russia's interest to just continue to try to destabilize the situation behind the scenes while not asserting direct top-down control over the region. Professor Rupi, you talked about winter approaching. Um, how badly are the sanctions hurting Russia? And is the pain being felt by the people who are making the national decisions? Oh, that is such a great question. I really wanted to get into that. Now, um, 
uh, as you can see, Russia's economy is deeply tied to oil prices. Um, and I thought I had a slide here that showed, uh, I guess not, that showed uh, the extent to which Europe is dependent on, on Russia for uh, its annual energy supply. Um, as you guys have uh, all, I'm sure, read, you know, Germany receives over a third of its energy from Russia. Um, and that's one of the reasons that German business leaders have just been appalled at the idea of, of uh, including energy imports and exports um, in the sanctions list. Um, but as regards the effects of these sanctions on Russia, they are having a bite, and in fact, Putin just canceled his annual budget address um, that um, is, you know, meant to discuss the state of the Russian economy, and people speculate it's because he doesn't really want to talk about the full extent of the economic impact. Um, what I don't understand, and what I don't think many people understand, is quite how power is working currently inside the Putin regime? It's a very interesting question. Now, these, these sanctions and, and also the ban on that, that Putin announced in retaliation, the ban on food imports from, from Europe, um, are, both these things are really hurting the ordinary Russian consumer. Right? There's, there are shortages, there are higher food prices, and there's general inflation overall. But like I said, the people, at least in the short term especially, don't really matter. I mean, Putin can control elections if he wants to. And, and, and again, these people are used to feeling disenfranchised. They're skeptical about the democratic political process, and they don't see themselves as having a lot of viable alternatives to Putin's leadership. But there are these oligarchs, right? And, and Putin is dependent on them to a degree. And it seems like it's not in their financial interest to... Um, you know, lose money in overseas accounts and lose business um, through, you know, this increasingly uh, conflictual atmosphere between Russia and the European Union. I mean, these are, these are people who have apartments in London, who send their kids to colleges in the United States. And on some level, they've got to be tearing their hair out um, as the situation continues to worsen. And so what I don't think anybody in the U.S. is fully sort of cognizant of is where sort of these, uh, where the balance of power inside the Kremlin lies. I mean, Putin can't be acting completely unilaterally. He has to have support from different groups, not from the people, but from different powerful, um, you know, interest groups. And even members of his obvious interest groups, like the security services or the military, these are all led by people that have financial interests in the West now because this is a global economy and we're all connected. And so while I think they can, you know, on, on the one hand sort of applaud Putin standing up to the United States and defending Russia's national interest, at some, at some moment there has to be a tipping point when their own economic interests are going to prompt them to, uh, you know, also call for compromise from within. I know people say, like, oh, they're afraid of Putin, and, but again, how does this mechanism of fear work? I mean, they can't all be afraid. I mean, if they all spoke up, I mean, Putin can't, um, you know, silence all of them, and they are powerful in their own rights. I mean, we're talking about billionaires who control some of, like, the largest industries in the world. He can, Putin can maybe target one or two of them for ostracism and repression, but he needs their support as a group. So I think the role of these oligarchs is going to be critical in the coming months. A few questions have come in about the Russian Orthodox Church. What is their stance toward Putin, and then vice versa. What's Putin's stance toward the church? Well, uh, these are great questions. Putin and the Orthodox Church are actually um, very powerful allies, at least, you know, at the official level. I mean, 
as with all you know forms of institutional religion, there's usually like sort of a a, a top level hierarchy that tends to be kind of more conservative than than individual like um, uh, church officials on the ground um, interacting with you know particular congregations, and you know they tend to be sort of more progressive and also more sympathetic to the needs of the individuals, but the Orthodox Church leadership is 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 very much um, sort of a supporter of Putin and his policies, and Putin, you know, in recent years since he um, took office this last time around, um, has been focusing on instilling values more than he ever has. He's been a lot, uh, you know, his his first. 12 years in office, he was focused on economic growth, and now he has has made a number of statements where he said that he wants to give Russians, you know, something to believe in. Um, he doesn't want that something to be communism, but he wants it to be sort of. Uh, it seems to be now, you know, a kind of a, a religiously infused patriotism that's actually grounded in quite conservative ideas of family and gender roles, and the church supports that. I mean, many of you are probably familiar with the scandal uh, uh, involving this punk rock group called Pussy Riot, where they, um, you know, there are uh, four women uh, saying an anti-Putin song in a Moscow cathedral, a cathedral that has sort of great symbolic significance to Orthodox believers and also to the Russian state, and they were immediately arrested and thrown into jail. And uh, you know, and they were mothers; they had young kids at home. They were kept in detention and not allowed to see lawyers for a long time, and they were sentenced to you know pretty harsh terms. And they became kind of a cause celeb in the West. And what was really disturbing to me is that actually inside Russia. Uh, they had very, very little public support. I mean, the majority of Russians thought what they did was bad and thought that they should be severely punished um, and, and thought that they uh, were guilty of blasphemy, right? So, um, so it's not just that the church and Putin are supporting one another, it's that these conservative values that both these um, groups, that the, both the executive and the, and the church promote are also um, you know, resonating in large sections of the Russian population. There's a lot of interest on the um, the, the question feeds about Putin himself, and um, one couple of interesting ones is in terms of succession. If something were to happen to Putin, who takes who takes power? Who's if there were to be a a uh, power vacuum? What what would happen, and how would this potentially impact? the situation in the Ukraine? Oh, well that's, I mean, another $10 million problem, uh, question. I mean, it's a great question. I mean, I was wondering the other day why the, I, I suppose I shouldn't say this, but you know, I mean, why the CIA doesn't, uh, I don't know, you know, hint around to see if there was a way to like tactically take Putin out should it come to that. But, um, uh, which is not an endorsement of the CIA doing anything like that um, ever, but uh, I think it is extremely unclear who would secede Putin. This is also a big pres uh, big problem that um, that we're all watching in Kazakhstan, where there has been the uh, same president in power uh, since 1991, and he's elderly and he's um, and he's sick. Uh, it's a state crime to even discuss the state of his health in public um, or to speculate about it. Uh, but rumor has it that he's got cancer. So, um, you know, these are both leaders that control territories with a vast amount of national of natural resources. Um, and and where there has historically been a great deal of difficulty in winning sort of um, uh, in being able to consolidate central power over the peripheries um, and I think it's a great concern I mean so far Putin has invested all of his resources into um, eliminating political rivals um, and in fact cultivating 
opponents, even like donating money to opponents like the communists, just specifically so that he can look so much better in comparison, right? So he actually will not just put down um, rivals that might support, you know, a, a platform that is, is much more about sort of individual freedoms and, and economic diversification, but he'll actually promote um, radical parties on both the right and the left, um, again, just to make himself look even more like the only viable alternative. So there's, there's no kind of charismatic figure that can take the reins. Uh, very recently, um, a former Russian oligarch, Mikhail Hordakovsky, announced plans to uh, form a Russian opposition. Um, Hordakovsky was once, uh, I think, the considered um, the richest man in, Mos uh, in, in Russia, if not right up there in the top five richest people in the world. Um, but he was targeted by Putin, some people said, because he was being openly critical of the Putin regime, and uh, eventually sentenced to corruption twice, and he spent a number of years in, in captivity in Siberia. So one would think that he has this great moral authority, I mean, because he suffered, he lost his fortune, he refused to uh, compromise, uh, he stuck to his guns, and and uh, and he you know, gave up a number of years of his life to do this. Um, but again, Hordakovsky is not popular amongst uh, the, mush the majority of the Russian population. And in fact, people saw his imprisonment, many people, as justified and as an example of how Putin was kind of bringing this Wild West capitalism and these uh, selfish oligarchs that had, had gained a lot of prominence in the Yeltsin era to heal. And uh, Putin himself cast his, his uh, sort of imprisonment of Hordakovsky as a victory of legality. You know, so there's, again, different ways of presenting um, that struggle, and there's not a real sign that someone like Hordakovsky could rally the people in, in the same way um, that Putin has been able to do so. So I think that this question of a power vacuum is 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 really a very very pressing one. Kind of shifting attention to another regional crisis, and that's what's happening in the Middle East, especially with Syria mm -hmm. and Iraq and with ISIS. Absolutely. What's Putin's relationship, support for, support against ISIS, Syria, Iraq, or that situation? Well, you know, Putin has said, as this crisis with the Ukraine has worsened, and as, um, you know, U.S. politicians have made more and more um, uh, sort of angry comments uh, towards the Kremlin, he's basically said, you guys are going to miss me when I'm gone kind of thing. And he's been very quick to point out that there are bigger threats to global security um, and that Russia has an important relationship with countries in the Middle East. Um, you know, and of course this war against ISIS is, <laughs> is the most pressing conflict we're facing and it's, and, and these conflicts are complicated because, you know, Assad, is, uh, who's the current leader of Syria, is, uh, is, is no one we want to work with either. And uh, Putin understands this, and he's talked about the important role Russia has played in working together with the United States in fighting international terrorism. And interestingly enough, the president of Jordan, who is U.S. educated and, and, and when he first took power years ago said something like, like the West Wing or some other, you know, very familiar American sitcom was his favorite TV show. Uh, he just gave a press conference talking about how there can be no Middle East stability without Russia playing an integral role in it. Um, so he made a very, very powerful statement of support. Um, for 
a Russian diplomatic presence in negotiating solutions to all of these problems. I mean, over Palestine, over Syria, over, uh, over fighting ISIS. Probably have time for a couple more questions. Um, one, uh, a handful that have come in um, have been in relation to the down Malaysian airliner. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a couple of questions of why, at least in the last few weeks, month, say, haven't we heard anything more about the downed airliner? Is there something being hidden? Is there, is there something behind the curtain? Um, there seems to be interest in that, in that downed airliner. Um, well, I don't think Russia's hiding anything. I think, um, I think actually there, there was just a, there was just a, a headline, I think, yesterday that, that, that said, um, I mean, and this is kind of gruesome detail, but where I think um, uh, Dutch investigators announced that one of the passengers was found wearing an oxygen mask, which suggests that uh, not everybody may have died instantly. Um, I think uh, the Dutch have shown such restraint in the face of this catastrophe. You know, the majority of the passengers killed on that airlines were um, Dutch citizens. And they've always insisted that there have to be a uh, careful investigation and not a rush to judgment. And, uh, and I think that they're investigating. Um, what I did wonder about was just this unbelievably atrocious situation that emerged um, after the flight was downed where investigators weren't allowed to get to the scene for weeks and and uh, and it seemed like uh, for you know at least a month afterwards not all the bodies had been recovered and and, and eventually that kind of um, uh, reporting about it once once the uh, the recovery teams actually left Ukraine after waiting in the hotel day after day after day after day for an all clear. Um, it kind of disappeared from from the headlines. Um, I think that that had partly to do with the fact that it was very confusing to all sides who was responsible for the fighting that was making it impossible for for investigators to get to the site and to secure it and to, to work there without being in fear of their own lives. Um, initially it seemed like the rebels had agreed to the ceasefire and the Ukrainian army um, saw a moment to go on the offensive. Um, the Ukrainian government of course denies that and says that um, it was the rebels who decided to go on the offensive, but I think that it was such a fraught diplomatic moment. I mean, it really at the time reminded me kind of of the assassination that of, of Archduke Franz Ferdinand um, that ended up sort of sparking World War I. I think people, uh, politicians and journalists, were just very aware in that moment that anything they wrote or said could have serious consequences. And so people were trying to be careful, more careful than they had been earlier on in the crisis. So we have time for one more question, and this has come up several times on the, on the question feeds. In your opinion, Professor Hooper, are we entering a second Cold War? Is this kind of the first domino toward a second oh. Cold War? Well, you know, I'd just be interested in hearing people's opinions on that. You know, I, I I can't help but say I have new respect for Neville Chamberlain and, and Deladier in that Munich conference in 1938 when they agreed to let Hitler take the Sudetenland, just thinking that you had to give diplomacy every single chance possible in order to um, avert a major global catastrophe. Um, you know, it was only retrospectively that that 1938 event was viewed as as being such a political failure when Chamberlain and Deladier returned home after negotiating this Munich Compromise. They were greeted by hysterical, cheering mobs throwing them flowers because everybody across Europe was so overjoyed that a major 
another, a second major global conflict had been averted, and it's, you know, a great tragedy that that wasn't the case. So I don't want to sound like an appeaser, but I also want to stress the, the urgent need for continued diplomacy, because frankly, I don't think we can afford a second globe, uh, Cold War. I think the world is in a moment of intense geopolitical change. I mean, I think we're in a crisis, and I think that there are problems out there that are going to threaten us uh, more than more than Russia does, and in fact, where I I I I would prefer to be allied with Russia um, than with you know any any number of 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 of, of these new entities that are appearing, and I think that in order to ensure stability in the in a whole variety of little hot spots, the big countries, the superpowers, are going to have to find some way to work together. So uh, I have to say, I think we need to focus on finding compromise and, and acknowledging that there are perhaps going to be different political paths, but in certain macro questions, there's still going to be space to work together. I don't know when too much compromise, when, there, what, yeah, when is, uh, what, what is the point at which we say this is too much compromise? I don't know what that is, and I fear that moment, but I do think that we should really heavily weigh the costs of, of any kind of second Cold War. We have to try no diplomacy again and again and again and again and again before we give up on it entirely. Well, fascinating presentation. Many thanks to Professor Hooper for sharing her time and knowledge with us today. And we hope to offer more of these lunchtime learning webinars in the new year. So stay tuned for more information in the coming months. In the meantime, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful holiday weekend.